Hi, Al Zagansky here. Thank you for joining me for another Typewriter Tuesday and welcome to my office. Altinganski.com and uh, YouTube slash Altinganski, all one word there. Today I want to show you an aristocrat. I want to show you a royal aristocrat from 1941 and that year makes it kind of special. I'll tell you why. So stay tuned. It's Typewriter Tuesday. Let's journey into the past to see what writers of old used to use to ply their trade. What kind of mechanical beauty does Al have for us this week? Hi, uh, here's the typewriter I was telling you about. This is a wonderful royal aristocrat typewriter. It's a medium sized portable. That is, it bridges the size of uh, an office standard typewriter and a much smaller portable that's meant to be carted around quite a bit. You can see it's a lovely little machine uh, and it looks very clean. It's still a little dirty on the inside because I've not done the, the kind of cleanup it needs uh, right now. I'm on a book deadline so it's going to be a little bit before I, I get to it. Uh, this is a, a fabulous typewriter and it's also fabulous for yet another reason and that is it's good to have a little history uh, behind you when you talk about typewriters. Typewriters are machines for people and people lived in historic times that uh, sometimes challenge them and this is certainly one of them which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, let's talk about the typewriter itself first. It's sleek, uh, it's clean, it has everything you need. Uh, it is on the lower end of the Royal uh, portables. Royal was a little late coming to the portable game. So by the time this little baby came out it was selling uh, portable typewriters hands over fists would go on to become a uh, Fortune 500 company and stay there for many years. The Royal Company uh, was started in uh, the early 1900s. The first portable typewriter, or the first typewriter, I should say, that came from Royal, uh, came out in, I believe, 1905. And um, they did quite well. They were innovative. One of the uh, founders, his last name was Hess, is uh, more than a bit of an inventor. Started to say he was a bit of an inventor. He was much more than a bit of an inventor. He has 140 patents with his name on him, so I guess that qualifies him to be uh, more than a bit of an inventor. Um, and uh, he ties into all of this. As I said, this is 1941, and 1941 is very significant in the history of the United States and in the history of typewriters. And the reason is, in 1941, as you probably know, the United States became involved in uh, the largest war in humankind. Uh, in humankind's history, and that is uh, World War II. Now, the United States was a little late getting into it, but in December of 1941, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, uh, enough was enough, and the United States entered the war, and of course they entered the European theater also uh, to help on, out on that front. When that happened, uh, typewriter companies were pressed into service, and uh, they began to make things other than typewriters. They are, in essence, machine shops. Uh, that had been geared to make typewriters. Now they were machine shops made uh, uh, geared to make machine guns, uh, geared to do um, even propellers, ammunition, small rifles, uh, all of those kinds of things. And, and Royal was pressed into that kind of service too, and they went to it. Which means that uh, they stopped making typewriters for the public. In Royal's case, they continue to make some typewriters of this model for the military, and you can find them. Uh, there's some that say Navy on them. There's uh, some that have been used in the Army, and uh, they're uh, colored green, as you uh, might imagine. And so uh, Royal made quite a bit for military service of this particular model. Now, this uh, model is used in several different under several different model names. Uh, the arrow is uh, very similar to it; has basically the same uh, material and set up as this one does. Okay, a couple other things on this. Well, you know, before I get to that, let me give you a little bit more history on this. The man I mentioned before, Hess, uh, died in 1941. So this is the last typewriter that he would see in that series. He had moved to Orlando, Florida from New York where uh, Royal had set up business and they did their manufacturing in uh, Connecticut uh, where they bought some property and put up a large building and began manufacturing things. Well, as you can see, a couple of things of, of note here. As we look at the keyboard, we see what's often called glass keys. 
the metal ringed keys. These are very nicely spaced, makes this very easy to type on. Very, very comfortable. No number one. That's to be expected, uh, especially in some of these uh, lower end portables. It does have a tab key, and that's, uh, that's really nice. And I'll show you how the tabs work a little bit later. But one of my favorite things is the shift mechanism because the key, the actual glass key, is uh, square. Or I should say rectangular. It's rectangular instead of round. And this is something Royal did on many of their larger typewriters. So hold on to your hats for a second. I'll try not to make you seasick, but I'm going to show you what I mean. Take a good look at this typewriter, and then look over here at this typewriter. They look very much alike. This is a standard size typewriter. It's meant for the office. It's a KMM, beautiful typewriter. Ray Bradbury typed on a typewriter like this when he wrote Fahrenheit 451. Rod Serling typed on it. Uh, when uh, doing the early parts of uh, his work and then in the uh, Twilight Zone and the later he started dictating uh, but he used a typewriter like that. Well this is sort of a scaled down version of it and it has again everything you need. You have the uh, bicolor ribbon uh, and then also the stencil which would be the white. Uh, this is where you adjust the tension on the keys. All the way to the right is much heavier and all the way to the left is much lighter for the action and then this is where you change the ribbon direction and this is really nice because it's all right up front. Now we move up to some of the other parts of the typewriter, some of the business ends and uh, you can see that the platen is fairly clean. You can see some people have been pounding on it uh, with no paper in it. Uh, I always gets on my nerves but these things are irresistible so I can't blame them too much. Uh, Nice paper bale, and it has over on the sides uh, easy to use knobs. You can release the carriage with a touch, and there's one on the other side. And then there is also uh, the tension release that is, it releases the friction rollers in the back. Uh, so you can slip heavier paper down so it'll get a grip, and then you push it back, and those rollers will press it against the platen. And then over on the other side here, we see some nifty little things. Nice return, uh, though it does get in the way of a few things. Uh, it's a little cramped over here. But as we zoom in here a bit, you can see over here, this is where you adjust the line uh, from single to double. You can certainly do that. The release for the carriage for the left-handers is right back here. And you have to get your finger. i got to get my... my pudgy little sausage fingers under there uh, and uh, to move that around so it's a little tight. Now one of the things uh, that Royal started doing was this thing called uh, the Magic Margin and you see them on the some of the larger typewriters of the era. Let me show you what that means. It's a nifty little thing and here we have our margin settings. Over here on the right you see the nice scale so this is set to stop the uh, typing at uh, 75. Over here you can see that, uh, and actually we'd use this, very difficult for you to see here I know, this area which I have set up by the 10, uh, the numeral 10 over here so you can uh, set the left side of the margin. But what is unique about all of this is the magic margin will let you set it wherever you have your carriage. So I have the carriage set about in the middle here and if I pull this forward, watch what happens to this margin setting. Don't blink. Here we go in three, two, one, boom. It's set right where I have uh, the carriage set. And you see this right down here. This is the center of it. Well, it now lines up with this up here. And so if I wanted to type just on the right-hand side of the page, I could do that. Very easy to move it back. It has a little push and spring mechanism. And you just pull it back to wherever you want. Or the other way to do it is hit margin release, backspace to where you want it, and then hit the uh, magic margin again and it will set it there. Really kind of cool uh, the way they did that. Very narrow paper table. And now let me swing around back and show you how to set the tabs. These are tabs are set manually. You can't do them from the keyboard. Uh, you have to do them from the back. And these little items are tab settings. You can see there is a, a scale back here that lets you know where you're setting your tabs. There are five of these. And 
uh, you simply push down, actually push in, and they move to wherever you want them. So you can set up five of them in whatever you want, it way you want. Five is not uh, a lot, but for this age machine, uh, it is uh, probably more than enough. And it's usually more than enough than what most of us use uh, for typing. Seldom do we need more than that unless you're typing in uh, something like an accounting ledger, that sort of thing. Uh, the feet on it are pretty good. Still need a little cleaning. Uh, the inside has a little puzzle for me. I'll just go ahead and share it with you and admit my ignorance. That's like admitting your ignorance and putting it on YouTube and your website. Uh, you can see the carriage mechanism. Carriage drops when you shift. Sometimes called a, a basket shift. Uh, sometimes called a segmented shift. And this makes it easier on the writer, uh, the typist, because you use your little finger and it's easier to let something drop than it is to lift the carriage. Okay, so that's all well and good like that. Still need some cleaning up here. Uh, but you'll notice I have this one key. This is the U. And notice it does not go all the way down. Drives me nuts. I've not been able to see any kind of uh, blockage, anything jammed in there. Uh, just means I, I'm probably going to have to take off the masks, take off the body, and look a little closer because I can't see down there quite well enough. But the interesting thing is it doesn't affect the typing. So there's a little something jamming this up so that it bounces when it goes back down. But the typing is just as smooth and it uh, hits the paper just as it should. Well, uh, here we have our reels. Actually, we call them spools. Uh, this is plastic, so somebody's changed the ribbon. It's a lot easier to just put the new plastic ones on than it is to uh, set it up to wind it on the originals, though I prefer the originals. But uh, having put a number of them on, I understand why people don't like to do it. It's uh, messy and it takes a little bit of time, but I like to keep the originality when I can do that. Alrighty, so here we have the uh, 1941 Royal Aristocrat. Uh, and in 1941, as we get into late 41, really December, uh, and then into 42 and so on, they stopped making these uh, for the public, but they do make some for the military. It was part of their military support, the way of supporting the U.S. in the war. And uh, so there weren't a great many after 1941. And then the year also carries the uh, sort of the sad news where the inventor of many of these things I've just shown you uh, had uh, passed away. He had moved again to Florida probably for retirement in 1941 since they started this in the early 1900s. So uh, he had lived a long life, but it was time uh, for him to move on. And then he moved into Florida and then uh, I don't know how long he had been there before uh, he passed away. Uh, but his name was Hess, and he uh, was a very inventive man, did a lot of good work. Well, there it is, 1941 Royal Aristocrat, in very good shape, uh, just a little dirty, needs a little more attention. And uh, I'll set up here and give you a little typing example. Hi, I'm back, and I promised you a little typing on our Aristocrat from 1941. And let's just give that a little shot. It has not been finely tuned yet, but I think... It'll prove itself to be a pretty good typer. Now, sometimes what I do is I use two pieces of paper, especially if the platen, uh, the rubber portion of the roller, is uh, a little extra hard. That gives a little more cushiony. So let's try the old tried and true uh, sentence that every typist uh, does to use every letter uh, in the alphabet. A quick brown fox jumps over the lazy typist. Okay, so I did a little editing. That works pretty good. Let's uh, tab and uh, maybe do something from uh, a nonfiction piece of uh, writing, perhaps. Uh, let me think here. The summer it was hotter than expected, and so were the tempers of the towns, townspeople in Dayton, Tennessee. Oh, that's enough of that.
Um, nothing will point out your weaknesses as a typist than using a manual typewriter, especially when you spend hours upon hours at a, a keyboard. But nonetheless, uh, the typing is pretty, pretty good. Uh, quick test to see how alignment is working. And that's a small h, cap h, and a lock h. Some people forget to do that one. And as I look at it, I see that things are fairly well aligned. And let's see if I can get this close enough for the camera. Now we need a new ribbon, but it types quite well. It's uh, still a little stiff, so it's going to need a, a little tuning up, uh, perhaps a spot of oil or two. Usually uh, you don't want to use much oil because it becomes gunk uh, over time, but uh, take a look at that. But all the action is very good. Uh, enjoy the key placement. Uh, fingers fit comfortably on it. They're dished just nicely. Uh, they're easy to read. They're clear. So everything you want in a typewriter, and again, Royal put these little square shifts uh, so you can distinguish them. And on their larger models, their desktop models, uh, office models, they have the tab and the backspace key are also uh, rectangular like that. Well, once again, this is Alton Gansky, altongansky.com or YouTube slash Alton Gansky. And this is Typewriter Tuesday. Thanks uh, for coming to my office and joining me. It's been fun. Goodbye for now.